we are at Digital Success Series in which we try and interview stalwarts from the industry who talk about what digital success means for them. We have with us Mr. Somil, who is the Chief Operating Officer at iJoint, wherein he oversees the client relationship, delivery and operations, has been an experienced executive with a background working in the finance, banking and technology sector, working specifically with Deutsche Bank, ENY and Deloitte in past. Thanks a lot, Somil, for joining us. Thanks, thanks. It's great to be here. Somil, uh, so uh, as you know, in this uh, spotty conversation which we have, we will try and understand what exactly you think uh, the industry is going towards and what are the various technology transformations we expect in the financial and specifically in the banking sector. To begin with, uh, an interesting factor and interesting data which I'll put it forward to you is that uh, in the last one year, we have seen a 120% rise in the funding in the fintech rising from $50.8 billion to $111.8 billion. What do you think has been the major uh, drivers for these growth? Yeah, I mean, uh, I totally agree that the fintech funding across the world has been rising quite rapidly. Um, I would say there are two or three sort of key factors there. One, <clears throat> on the retail side, um, you know, as consumers have become more and more used to digital, uh, digital technologies in their daily, daily lives, whether it be for shopping or listening to music or consuming media or whatever, um, there is obviously uh, a huge amount of catch-up that is possible in financial and related services. So obviously there's a lot of investor money going on that thesis, that, um, that new and better digital access models for retail financial services will emerge and they will emerge more likely from small, nimble, innovative companies. And that's sort of driving a lot of fintech funding. A second factor, and that's on more on the wholesale side of finance, is that um, you know, ever since the financial crisis, since 2008, the focus in wholesale finance has been on uh, risk, regulation, security, and those kind of things. And as, um, you know, as a lot of recapitalization, as a lot of restructuring has, has been concluded, um, you know, there, there, is, there is a sense that um, transformation, efficiency, customer service is back on the agenda for wholesale financial services too. So both of these sectors are seeing a lot of fintech investments. That's an interesting thought, Somil. But again, uh, I, you, you've already highlighted what are the major factors. But do, do you think innovation and primarily innovation around customer experience, process simplification, and, and basically having an open APIs, uh, do you see these trends evolving and gradually setting up the tone for the industry in the years to come? Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. I mean, improving customer experience. Um, I, th this is an area where financial services obviously lags behind compared to a lot of other industries. You know. um, and, and, and putting that in the forefront is something that companies have already started doing in the last uh, few years. And I think this is a trend that's going to accelerate. Process simplification, I mean, this is, this is the Achilles heel of financial services, right? I mean, large companies, as they grow in size, their process becomes more complex, they take more right. time right. Uh, to process client requests. So how to get better, better customer service through speed and turnaround time and and, and so on is quite an important factor. And then for shareholders, cost savings through process simplification. An API is, is, is API-based architecture or open banking or open insurance. I mean, these are very, very clear ways in which processes can be simplified. I'll take a personal example, right? I mean, on Friday, I had to transfer some amount of money um, from the UK to the US, you know, for a particular, uh, for a particular, um, for a particular transaction. It is not a large amount of money, um, you know, a few thousand dollars. Um, I tried to do it through my bank, through online banking of my bank. Um, and obviously I saw a particular amount of fees or whatever compared to, and the FX rate compared to what I could see on Google. And right. I kind of said, hmm, I'm spending $200, $300 making this transaction. That really doesn't sound nice. Um, I checked on, on, on another alternative fintech provider. Um, mm -hmm. And I could, I could do the same transaction, getting the money from the same bank account using open banking APIs getting the money from the same bank account and do the same transaction at a cost that was less than one fourth, maybe about 20, 22% of what I would have paid with the bank. So, so, you know, by, by, by this activity, I was able to, I was able to save a couple of hundred dollars or a couple of hundred pounds in fees. I was able to, to actually have a much more digital experience and an experience that I trusted. And this was a result of process simplification and APIs and, and thousands of people doing that every other minute that's what's going to lead to the growth of innovative -led, innovation led business models wonderful so again uh, this whole uh, customer experience process simplification is always 
right now gets carried away with some buzzwords like blockchain, IoT, which again tries to improve the speed, accuracy and transparency. Do you, do you think these would be the major drivers in terms of technologies or do you think there is something more better to come in future? Well, I, I definitely hope that there is more stuff to come in future, that this is not the end of, of innovation. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, one comment that I would make, you know, uh, blockchain, IoT, um, APIs, I mean, these are all extremely important drivers for process simplification, for better customer journey. The challenge really is or will be in the coming years, how to encapsulate the complexity of, uh, of the technology away from the end user so that the customer in the process of making customer experience better we do not make the customer experience more confusing or complex and that is something that you know that more focus has to go in in the financial industry i always take this example with my colleagues that uh, you know i do not use spotify because they have got an excellent uh, cloud content storage mechanism or an excellent microservices architecture right. or the way to kind of deliver a lot of content on mobile right. i use Spotify because I can listen to the songs that I want, right. you know, so, so it's, it's that sort of simplification of uh, the end customer experience that has to sit, sit around financial services as well, using technologies that you mentioned. Right. So now, now coming back to what the industry is going through, you've already highlighted how exactly, you know, the whole journey of simplification and like how you have been able to witness it, doing it in your personal life. Now you have been working in a distribution, distributed leisure technology. And what do you think, what you really want to understand what was an idea which you put behind uh, while creating that? And do you think it uh, solving the re uh, reconciliation issues and improving the efficiency across the globe for global corporations? So that's absolutely spot on. Yeah, I mean, um, our thinking with distributed ledger technology at Adjoint um, is not so much, uh, is not driven at all by, by cryptocurrencies. And it's not even driven so much by the concept of digital assets. It's really driven by the concept of digitization of processes. So, okay. uh, you know, any kind of enterprise to enterprise transaction that you see in the world today involves on multiple data silos that exists in different branches, different subsidiaries, you know, different departments of one company with other branches, subsidiaries and departments of the same company, as well as different other companies that they transact with in a B2B marketplace or in a distribution marketplace or something like that. And, and because all these data silos are totally disconnected, the, there is a huge amount of operational process, some of it automated, some of it still manual um, that goes through to reconcile data across these silos. And that is what really makes the transactions a lot slower, uh, a lot more complex, uh, a lot more costly than they can be. And that ultimately leads to poor client experience. So our thinking really is about how do we use distributed ledger technology to ensure data consistency for parts that have to be consistent across these silos. Um, and and that, that is something that distributed ledger, distributed consensus allows us to do. And then on, then on top of that, we can have true multi-party process automation. So it is not just about process automation within a department or within a company. It's about true multi-party process automation. So that's what we are going after as a joint. So, so what I understand is that you're trying to simplify how exactly the whole payment mechanism currently works into multiple organizations. And every, every organization and every department of the organization can automate the whole process, right? That's correct. And it's not just for payments. It's also for things like lending. It's for things like uh, FX hedging. It's for things like swaps and so on. So. Okay. Wonderful. So uh, now this is, this is another innovation, which, which is, uh, as, as you rightly mentioned, is about digital transformation in terms of process. So there are some really good product innovations which are happening across the globe, uh, which, which is trying to touch how exactly we behave with the financial and the insurance industry at large. Uh, do you, have you kept anything in mind and you're watching anything in particular in the, all the innovations which are surrounding us? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I used to, I used to work in, um, in financial and technology areas in the early days of the internet as well. Um, and, um, and, you know, this still feels not quite like 2001 or 2002. It still feels like, feels like the late 90s. So I think, I think, I think good Im innovations will emerge. So, so really the, the, the market tracking, as you kind of hint or allude towards, it's a really, really important part of my job and we should all do it right. because, because we still do not know where the good ideas are going to come from and what is going to gain currency, what's going to become more popular. So, uh, so I, think, I think in the last couple of years, uh, you know, we've seen the hype come down a little bit. For example, in the distributed ledger space, 
and, and we still see the hype kind of going up, for example, in machine learning space. Um, but we need to keep an eye on the market because good ideas are still going to come from some of these fintech investments that you sort of talk about. So I, I don't think I can sort of name one or two, um, but, but there is everything to play for. Wonderful. So you're keeping a, a very close eye on the machine learning space. Uh, definitely. And, and an open mind. Yes. Okay. Okay. Now, now coming back to how exactly fintech uh, is tra- trying to change how finance actually works, operates. There are various fintech platforms, which uh, some of which I'm pretty sure you're aware of, is trying to change the how the way the whole uh, process works in the financial industry. So do you think innovation at scale has to breed together? Uh, how, how do you think that evolving the banks uh, trying to integrate themselves with fintech or the fintech voting to the various banks and then offering their services? How do you think this innovation will gradually breed at a scale level? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously for, for innovation to be successful, it has to work at the scale that, you know, the customers are. And, and, and typically the more profitable innovations are the ones that serve more customers. There's no doubt about that. However, in terms of marrying innovation with scale, um, I mean, you mentioned APIs and all that, you know, they become an important part of the, of the story. But what we really need to allow to do is to let innovation grow in its own ecosystem as well. So by putting scalability requirements on innovative projects too soon or integration requirements on innovation projects too soon, that can be sometimes a wrong strategy. Sometimes, of course, the innovation cannot exist without integration or without scale. An innovation comes in to be only when 100,000, a million, or 10 million customers use it. That, that, there are obviously those type of innovations too. But, but a lot of time, innovation can grow in its own way. And you know, we, have, we have examples of really, really successful companies coming from, uh, from, from the internet era and Web 2.0 era. They did not really, I mean, they, they have absolutely grown to the scale of having you know, global reach. I mean, think of Amazon or, 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 or Facebook or whatever. But they did not really. Uh, they did not really start with saying, "Well, I need to, I need to offer a new and innovative product, and also integrate or scale with the old world at the same time." They kind of built an innovative product. They built a, a tall spire in that area, and then expanded. So you know, th- those are the sort of things that that all of us have to think through. Okay, moving moving on and coming back to the commodities, big data. So uh, it, it is often said that the largest challenge faced with the commodities big data is to manage and make sense of their unconnected data. What what do you think about it? How exactly this is going to operate and how how do you think this is evolving? Yeah. I mean, as I said, I'm keeping a very, very open mind on on machine learning. Um, I I think, I think even before connection of data, because connections can be discovered through, through algorithms in ways that are better than, better than some kind of fixed connections. I think, I think the real challenge that sort of holds people back is data quality. Um, because the data sources are so varied, because um, the current instrumentation and the historical instrumentation that collects data is not, has not really been always at the same level of effectiveness as it is today, uh, data quality has, that, that's available to us is sometimes not quite to the level that leads to a use case success. Um, you know, I've been following some projects, for example, in the energy domain, in the commodities sector, um, which are really around how to apply machine learning to improve data quality. And, and, and those are the kind of things that I find extremely fascinating because improvement to data quality is a key enabler for then analyzing the data in, through machine learning type of methods and then coming to unique insights. So, so really, uh, for me, what's, what's really exciting at this point of time are projects that look at, especially in the commodity sector, are projects that look at how to improve data quality and then apply machine learning to it uh, or big data methods to it. Um, and, and projects to improve data quality, as I said, you could apply machine learning itself to improve data quality. Other projects to improve data quality may be um, you know, using distributed ledger and, and, and APIs to make sure that there isn't too much keying and rekeying of data that leads to poor data quality. Uh, there isn't too much off-system data or, or, or non-digital data that leads to poor data quality. So, so, so really, um, it's about those sort, of, those sort of initiatives that improve data quality that are most exciting to me at this point in time. And then six months from now or 12 months from now, we'll be in a different stage. Wonderful. Are you working anything in particular at AdJoin with, with improving the way data is at your client level or anything, which you help them manage your client's data well? Any, any oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. I mean, so, 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 so whether it's, I mean, the most, the most prominent use case that we are working on in AdJoin is around corporate treasuries. And some of these are treasuries which are in commodities companies, some of them in 
services companies, some of them in financial companies, some of them in industrial manufacturing companies, you know, so a variety of, variety of uh, industry verticals. And absolutely, one of the key benefits that they get out of that is having better data around their inflows and outflows. And then on top of that data, they could apply techniques such as machine learning or advanced analytics to come to better forecasting. So it's really, this is the step-by-step -step thing. You know? Make sure that you have right data quality. Then only can you do better analytics around it. If you have data which is batched, which is manually reconciled, which is manually corrected as you go along, and then you try to apply, apply advanced analytics to it, then obviously you kind of end up getting questionable results. Yeah, also, also banks or banking sector in specific has a huge amount of data with them. How, how, mm. they, how the users behave, how they interact, and how, how do they everything. The whole process, the data is it's mammoth. So, do, do you yeah. have any, any thought, any framework which you can advise to these banks? Because so, so if, if you look at uh, countries like India, which has a, a growing sector in terms of bank, and you have now non-banking non financial corporations also coming into the picture. Do you have any any advice for those people to think of how they manage? Because they're starting with a very scratch level currently. Yeah, I mean, I, I would not I would not presume to be able to advise uh, without kind of knowing the details of the case. But what I would say is that. Focus on data quality as the first step, and then think of analytics. Uh, because if you do not have access to good quality data, if you have access to data that's batched, manually corrected along the process, then applying advanced analytics methods or machine learning methods to it can only result in, in tears. But then the benefits that you get out of data quality and then analytics on top of that are must save. So I know, for example, of some projects where, I've in, where I'm involved with in India across NBFCs and banking domain looking at retail financial products and you know how to improve the suitability of the product for the customer, how to improve um, the speed of transactions with the customer, you know, improve the customer experience, but also in sort of slightly more, um, uh, more difficult areas. Imagine a loan has gone bad. What are the methods to actually turn it back to a good loan? When should we do restructuring? When should we cut our losses? You know, all of that sort of analytics. All of these are possible if you have access to good data. Right, right, right. That's a good advice and a thought to put forward. So right now, tech digital, to be honest, has all often comes as I as I rightly pointed out earlier, is that there are a lot of buzzwords. And then you mm. said that there's a hype and machine learning, for example. Right now, it's, it's one of the buzzwords. Do you think what do you think is the most hyped digital technology right now, which is available, which you would say is not? I, I, I don't. Yeah. I don't think you should ask me. I think you should ask Gartner. They, 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 they come out with these hype curves from time to time. And they're fairly accurate, right? So, so I think a year and a half ago or something like that, they kind of said that you know, blockchain, at least in, in the private space, is, I'm, I'm sorry, in the public space, is at a peak of, um, of, 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 of the hype curve. And sure enough, you know, it has come down quite substantially. I think enterprise blockchain is still kind of at or, or maybe just before peak. So it's still going up rather than coming down. That's that sort of my feeling in the market. Um, but yeah, I mean, for companies like Adjoint, our, our sort of companies, it's really important um, to kind of go up the hype curve and then come down because quality shines when, when the hype comes down. So, so we actually welcome that quite a lot. Wonderful. So you now thinking about blockchain as something which, which will gradually perform in the sector? Enterprise oh, absolutely. Blockchain. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, uh, no, look, think about it. Um, would we still have manual reconciliation across these data silos, as I described, five years from now, 10 years from now, A, right. highly unlikely, and B, if that does happen, that will be a, a really, a really dispiriting future to be a part of. But yeah, no, I, you know, absolutely, absolutely. I, I, think, I, think, I think we already have learned uh, from the mistakes of the past, from the problems of the past, and, and a lot of forward-thinking corporations, some of them are clients, some of them not, um, are, are really working very, 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 very hard and with a lot of focus um, to, to, to eliminate those problems. Wonderful. Now, coming back to what exactly we, the whole conversation stands around is digital success. How do you define digital success for you? What does digital success mean for you? I think, I think success for any services company and financial services is a type of services. Uh, success for any services company is really around, you know, is around the client experience, right? Is the client happy? Is, does the client come back for more? You know, did they get what they want? Um, and, 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 and that's true for digital as well. Right. So, uh, you know, it is not when we talk about process simplification, when we talk about API based architecture. All of it is ultimately geared towards 
a, a blockchain or machine learning. All of it is ultimately geared towards how do we make the customer happier? So, so yeah, I mean, success for me is really driven by, are we able to delight our customers? Uh, are we getting more customers? You know, that, that, those sort of customer metrics. Really. So you're completely a customer oriented and- uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, why do we why do we reduce costs? Well, we reduce costs so that we can offer offer services to customers at a, at a you know at, at at a better scale and and open up strategic possibilities for us. You know, things like that. Really, absolutely. Success is all about uh, how happy the customer is, and that is what gives a return to the shareholders and whatever. Wonderful. Uh, keeping you up, and I'll let you go uh, now, uh, Somel, is the last question before I let you know. A single piece of advice you would put it forward to all the budding young CXOs who are looking up to you as a mentor for 2019. So I, yeah, I, I may come across as a little bit boring and a bit of a stuck record, but yeah, think about the customer, right? I mean, so, so how is it that this particular initiative is going to help the customer of the organization, right? I mean, if once, once we sort of start thinking about that, then a lot of other 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 blocks fa fall into place, and especially if you're working in the enterprise space, you know this this is the best story to go in with. If you go in with a story which is, hey, I can get you re reduce cost and all that, there are many ways in which companies can reduce cost, right? I mean, uh, they don't have to go for a, a, a totally gives new architecture in order to reduce costs. There are some traditional tested ways, process reengineering, offshoring, you know, all sorts of ways in which people can reduce costs. Right. Um, if you go in with, uh, with compliance, you know, as I mentioned, it's an important factor, but people do feel that they have, they have put their hands around the compliance problems to a great extent, maybe not wholly, but very substantially. Right. So, 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 you know, going in with the customer journey in the enterprise space, I feel is the right way. And if you're in the retail space, it is, of course, all about the customer. So, yeah, absolutely. My, 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 my single piece of advice is, you know, if you're thinking about digital, think about how does it help the customer of the organization who's going to deploy the digital tool. Wonderful, wonderful. So, well, it was a pleasure talking to you. And it was a pleasure that you joined us and you took it out uh, early in the day. I've watched you. You've been kind enough to join us. Thanks a lot for joining us. We'll definitely get back to you and have more such conversations. We wish you all the very best and we look forward to having a conversation soon. Thanks. Thanks. It's wonderful to talk to you as well. And hello to all your viewers once more. Thanks a lot, Samuel. Have a good day.